the last video of this lecture on marginal treatment effects, I will walk you through how you can actually estimate a marginal treatment effects model, how you set it up and how you estimate it. So what we need for that is, first of all, we have the classic Roy model, whereby the potential outcomes are related to observable and unobservable determinants. And we also have a selection equation, um, whereby the treatment is some function of an instrument and also a, an individual specific uh, resistance to treatment or an individual specific cost. And so what we have to assume here uh, is that the instrument, whatever that is, that is something that is, just, that is uh, changed by the policy we're interested in, that that is independent of the unobserved determinants of the potential outcomes. And it's also independent of this cost parameter or this, 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 this individual specific cost term. It's not a parameter, it's, it's an individual specific term. So in other words, potentially conditionally on some, some observed variables x, the instrument should be as good as randomly assigned. That's when those assumptions hold. We also have to make the standard local average treatment effect assumptions of we have a strong first stage. So people who were highly encouraged to take the treatment by the instrument should have a greater likelihood of taking the treatment than people who were, who were not as much encouraged or not encouraged at all. And the instrument should shift everyone into or out of the, the treatment. And these shifts should go in the same direction. So if the instrument goes, if, if the first stage is positive, then the instrument should increase everyone's likelihood or keep it at the same level, but it should not at the same time increase it for some and decrease it for others. That would be a violation of monotonicity. In that case, we would have fires. What we don't need to assume here, and that's important, is we don't need to assume anything about the correlation of uh, the resistance to treatment and the unobserved returns to treatment. And we also don't need to assume anything about the independence of, uh, of any determinants of the outcome and, and observed and unobserved determinants of the outcome. Um, that's, that's simply not, uh, not necessary here. Um, it would neither simplify nor complicate the analysis, or it wouldn't simplify it, it would may, may even complicate. And so what's central to the marginal treatment effects estimation is, 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 is the propensity score that someone takes the treatment if their value of the instrument is what it is. So, so for a given level of the instrument, what is the propensity of taking the treatment? Think about the example of the, the bed nets in, I believe, Kenya, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, in, the, in the last lecture, uh, there was different levels of subsidies that people were randomly assigned. And uh, so what the propensity score tells us here is for a given level of subsidy, what is a person's or a group's likelihood of getting treated? And the way this is typically done, a convention in the marginal treatment effects literature, because it simplifies the analysis and especially the graphical exposition, is to define the um, to define this propensity score as the quantile of the resistance distribution. Now that's something we need to we need to think about again. So you have here a uh, a selection equation, which is um, the so people select into the treatment if that 
term d if that if d star is greater than zero and d star in the simplest of cases is something like is something like this right so you have this idiosyncratic resistance to treatment and that resistance to treatment has some distribution maybe normally distributed maybe extreme value distributed depends on what we assume here now what we are gonna do now or, or what what we do then to uh to to simplify things is is to say well what is the the so we, we're going to transform the distribution of that of that uh, resistance, which may have all sorts of sh come in all sorts of shapes and forms. We, we transform this into a uniform distribution. And we do this by simply looking at the quantiles of this, of the distribution of this resistance parameter. Okay, so are you in the first, in the fifth, in the tenth, in the whatever percentile you are? Okay. So we have here Fv being the cumulative density function of that resistance, uh, the, the resistance value. And we then look simply at the, the, the quantile um, of the, the the resistance distribution at a given level why is this useful well it's useful because obviously here that the treatment choice hopefully if the first stage is there depends on the instrument okay? and 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 we know that um people who have chosen the treatment in response to being to being assigned a certain instrument are those for whom the observed encouragement and the, the additional boost they get from that encouragement must have been larger than the unobserved resistance. And, and so, so we can then readily compare, even if we don't observe that resistance, we, we must say that that propensity that they take the treatment must be greater then the, the quantile in the resistance distribution, and they're both at the same scale. Yeah, they're both uniformly distributed. So, so, so that's what, what makes the, the, the that, that's why we're, we're, we're uh, transforming this, this uh, resistance distribution. Now, to, to, arrive ultimately at the marginal treatment effects estimator and at the marginal treatment effects curve that I've shown in the previous video, we need to again, again take a step back and move back to the local average treatment effect and the wald estimator. So remember the wald estimator tells us what well, the, the, the local average treatment effect, namely the reduced form, which is here in the numerator, to what extent does the out the average outcome change or to what extent is it different between those people who have been encouraged to take the treatment and those who haven't that's when the instrument is binary and we scale this up by the share of people whose behavior has actually been changed right because the, this this difference in averages in the reduced form is obviously the difference in averages that incorporates everyone's outcome, even those of those people whose behavior has not been changed. And but if we want to get at the the actual average difference of the outcomes for those people whose behavior has changed and only those, then we need to scale it up by the first stage, by the likelihood, by the difference in likelihood of of treatment between those who were offered the treatment and those who weren't. Now that's, 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 the wild, that's the wild estimator. So the reduced form divided by the first stage. And we've, we've seen before that the local average treatment effect, um, if, if we use that uh, notation from marginal treatment effects, 
is or of, of the Roy model more broadly is the difference in 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 observed um, uh, the difference that can be ascribed to observed characteristics but also then the difference that can be ascribed to individual specific unobserved characteristics that are specific to the compliers right? and so so the, the the population of compliers may be obviously very different um, so so that those unobserved returns to the treatment may be different for the compliers than for uh, for never takers or always takers that's what we've learned so far and now with the with the marginal treatment effects estimator we're putting this idea of, of a local average treatment effect and of the world estimator to a more advanced use. Because what you need in order to trace out this marginal treatment effects curve, so for people at different levels of likelihood of them taking the treatment, you want to know what is their treatment effect. You obviously need lots of data and instruments that shift people in and out of treatment at different segments of that of that curve and the only way to do this is to either have a continuous instrument or an instrument that is discrete but has more than 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 two or three options so here let's think about it as a a discrete instrument and let's think about it as if we did a pairwise comparison of walled estimators. Why would we do this? Well, we, we do a pairwise comparison for all, com for, for all possible combinations of values of, of that instrument. Okay, so instead of ha having an instrument that is zero and one um, and, and can only be one of those two values, imagine one that is continuously distributed between zero and one, and you can have any value from between zero and 100%, for example. Yeah? And so then we can obviously think about different pairwise comparisons, one where we compare, let's say, if, if the instrument is between zero and one, uh, a, a, a value of z equals 0.8 and a value of z equals 0.7, but we could also think about uh, a, a, a comparison, let's say, of, I don't know, 0.2 and, and 0. And so, so these would be pairwise comparisons for different values of the instrument. And so then obviously moving from one value of the instrument to another, think about moving from a low subsidy to a high subsidy will shift units into or out of treatment. Hmm? And so the, the, the pairwise local average treatment effect is simply the average treatment effect again of those people complying with the change in the instrument. So who are shifted into or out of treatment. And so that is then being put to use when th this idea of having many, and if we have a continuous instrument, an, an, an infinite number of pairwise comparisons is put to use to, to, to move towards the marginal treatment effects curve. So here we first of all see the first stage. Um, and the first stage here is, is quite informative because it, it, it again tells us, well, who are the, 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 the people who get shifted into the, into the treatment or at what segment of that distribution of the instrument do we actually see that people are getting uh, shifted into the treatment? Now here in, in that uh, review paper that, that actually lays out the method very nicely by Cornelissen et al., a paper I highly recommend if you want to apply this method and even if you don't, if you want to understand treatment effects, read that paper. Um, they take the example of the distance between your birthplace and the nearest college as an instrument. So the idea is that the closer you've been born to a, 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 a college, 
um, the cheaper it is for you to attend a college, which for certain parts of the population is probably has a strong first stage. For other people who are always takers, it probably doesn't. You know, who would anyway go to college no matter how far away it doesn't. And for those people who would never, but there are probably some people whose decision whether to go to college or not is actually affected by how far away that, that, that college is. But that's obviously a continuous variable. And uh, now we can think about what the, the, the first stage could look like. And so, so and here, the idea is that if we decrease the instrument from, let's say, 120 to 90, so we compare people who uh, go to, uh, who are at a distance of 120 and say, what would happen if they were only at a distance of 90? Well, if, if this curve is the first stage, then um, the the corresponding increase in, in the likelihood of going to college is they would move from, from 0.5 to 0.75 here. Okay, so what is it what we see here on the, on the vertical axis? If you remember the marginal treatment effects curve, we had u d here, and then we had the treatment effect here and, and saw some downward sloping curve. What is here on the vertical axis is the horizontal axis for the marginal treatment effects curve. So what the first stage tells us is basically, if I change the instrument from this part to that part, I'm moving from this point in the likelihood of taking the treatment to that point here, from 0.5 to 0.75. Now, obviously, that, that is hard to do for a, uh, a if, if I wanted to, and, and, and what I would need in order to trace out the marginal treatment effects curve as one ingredient would be, I would need to know all the pairwise comparisons between those those different values of the instrument now that's obviously impossible um, but what i can do is i can i can bin the the instrument and and say you know for given levels of the instrument what is the likelihood of um of getting um the taking the treatment and so if i move from two from the second ventile here to the first, um, to what extent does that increase the likelihood of, 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 of taking the treatment or not? Okay. And so, so, so that is what you, what you have here on, on the left hand side on, on, the, on the horizontal axis is the propensity score. Is that propensity score that we were talking about? Now, what we don't know, but what we have to estimate is this black curve here. That's what we ultimately have to estimate in order to then arrive at the marginal treatment effects curve. So we have to either make some parametric assumptions about what that curve looks like, or we have to actually estimate it based on some non-parametric pr procedure based on, for example, those bins. Why can't we just take it from the data? Because if we took it purely from the data based on some non-parametric procedure, we would need to make all sorts of pairwise comparisons. So we would need to compare people at a at zero distance to people at a distance of uh, 140 and their a likelihood of, uh, of going to, to college, for example. But then these people may be very, very different. And so if, if I wanna compare people with the same X variables as I have here, 
um, let's say for, for everyone whose parents have already a, a, a college degree, I would probably not observe people whose parents have a college degree across the entire support of that distribution. And so I can't make all those pairwise uh, comparisons. So I either have to make an assumption about the shape of that, that, uh, that function, or I need to, to do it with a finite number of, of, of bins and compare them. Okay, so, so, so the idea here is basically that we obtain the, so, so the, the, what, what this curve gives us basically, um, or let's look at it better here. We, we change the value of the instrument that changes then the likelihood of taking the treatment. That's the first stage. And then we can do the same, obviously, for the, for the outcome, which is the reduced form and put them on a walled estimator, right? That's, that's what we, that's what we do here. Um, so basically for each of those bins, we say, well, for each of those bins, what is the average level of treatment or treatment propensity? And for each of those bins, what is the average outcome? And if, if I put the two together, here the average outcome and here the average treatment, well, then the, the wall estimator is nothing more than one over the other, and it's that. And so if I have different groups defined by X, then I would simply average across all those. Okay, that, that's, what, that's what an IV estimator with a continuous instrument, what it would, what it would come down to. Okay, so, so I take at different levels of, of the instrument, I take the propensity to take the treatment and at different levels of the instrument, I look at the outcome and then I, I take the, the, the average across all those and, and weight them then um, and, 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 and have basically, if, if I do this over multiple groups, I weight them over these groups. How exactly those weights come about, um, you, you, you can read this up in an econometrics book. It has to do with the variation of, of of the treatment within each of those 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 groups and the higher the level of variation within each of those groups the higher is that weight and but but for the moment the important thing is just that that it's a weighted average across all the lates of those those specific groups so let's go back to the marginal treatment effect um and and uh, this, this all may seem a bit all over the place we're, we're talking here about wall estimators and then about marginal treatment effects um but these these are all different ingredients of the overall procedure that we will all then put together in 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 the end of this in the end of this video so remember the marginal treatment effect was the treatment effect for people at, with a given propensity score that at that propensity score are exactly indifferent between taking the treatment or not. Okay, so, so these are the people for whom in this uh, selection equation, which is alpha plus Z delta plus VI, in this selection equation where at their level, uh, at their propensity score, which, which is determined by their individual specific uh, cost, apologies, where D star is exactly zero. So these are the people who are indifferent. And so their treatment effect, again, is their, the uh, treatment effect, the, the difference in outcomes that is due to uh, average differences um, under treated and, and controlled state and uh, or, or let's say due to un to observed um, differences and also then due to unobserved returns. And so, so the interpretation here, what is the marginal treatment effect? Is it the treatment effect of a person or unit with observable characteristics X 
who is at the youth quantile of the distribution of of uh, of resistance or roughly speaking of the likelihood of taking the treatment so it's simply that the person who is just indifferent between taking the treatment or not then the idea is if we shift if we depart from there and shift one more marginal person into treatment or one more marginal person out of the treatment what is the change then in the treatment effect that we should expect that's the slope of that marginal treatment effects curve that's exactly what we see here right so for a given propensity of taking the treatment if we change that propensity by a small amount then what is the expected difference in the outcome that's what the marginal treatment effect exactly tells us now the question is how to estimate that okay and so so maybe just a final comment here again the marginal treatment effects curve is is exactly that is this is this conditional expectation here um relative to the likelihood of of taking the treatment uh, which is high here and low there or the resistance to taking the treatment which is one at its highest and zero at its lowest and then i i want to know what the slope of that curve is whatever it looks like and so so then i start at a given level let's say here um, so I have a low propensity to take the treatment to begin with. I have a high resistance and I'm asking myself, what if I shift one more person into treatment? What is the gain, the, 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 the slope that I get here? And, is that, that, and, and so obviously you could think about a marginal treatment effects curve that flattens off or, or that, that is straight, a straight line or whatever it is. We, we, we obviously don't know and that's why we estimate it. So how do we do that? The problem here is that we need to know the, the, the unobserved returns to treatment, nor the unobserved costs of taking the treatment. And so, so in other words, um, th there are a, a lot of things in here that we don't observe. Um, and so we need to make assumptions about them. And the assumptions that, that, we, that are obviously the most straightforward to make is what Berglund and, and Moffitt in their early work have done. So they have just assumed that those three variables are jointly normally distributed with a given variance and covariance matrix. And so then you, you can obviously, with some weak identifying assumptions, that you know the instrument is as good as randomly assigned that uh, whatever there, there are certain exclusion restrictions and and then you can simply estimate that with maximum likelihood so that that is that is a fairly straightforward procedure once you once you make those assumptions the problem is that it's not clear whether the the, the assumptions that go into that may be too strong and right? because he, a normal distribution is a very particular distribution. It's symmetric. It's inconsistent with quite a lot of choice models. And so, so it may not be the best. So then um, Heckman and, 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 and Wittlersil in, in a couple of papers have actually developed a fully non-parametric version that uh, at, at the core of which are those let me go back here are those pairwise comparisons of the treatment effects if if my instrument shifts people uh, into treatment here what is the effect and if it shifts people into treatment here what is the effect but obviously i need to have a lot of variation in my instrument to do all those pairwise comparisons, even if I do it here with, with different bins. Right? And, but if I had that, if I have a lot of variation, for example, um, you know, in, in, within each of those, those bins, I have lots of variation in 
people who take the treatment and those those who, who don't um once i move them from one bin to another i would have lots of variation um then i could do that but it's very demanding on the data and therefore what the the, the solution is that 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 the literature seems to have converged to is to do to have some some sort of shape restrictions so you assume that the potential outcomes are linear and, and, and separable. So you have an observed and an unobserved component that, uh, that drive the, the uh, potential outcomes. And you assume that the marginal treatment effect curve is, is independent of X. So to, to show you how this works, let's, let's again move to the marginal treatment effect. And what one can do here is the following. So, so again, the marginal treatment effect is nothing more than the expected outcome for given observed variables X and the given propensity to take the treatment. And then I want to have a marginal change in, uh, in, uh, the, um, uh, in, in the propensity score and that then gives me um, you know, basically the, 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 the slope of the marginal treatment effect curve. So what is that outcome, that outcome equation? Um, or how do I get there? Well, we need to do something with that expectation here. In Björklund and Moffitt, we've used the assumption that these, these, uh, these values for the unobserved returns, they're normally distributed and they have some correlation with the unobserved cost of taking the treatment. And then I can simply express this in terms of uh, covariances, variances and, and the inverse Mills ratio and I'm done. Here, the idea is instead of having this, this very strict um, parametric approximation here, I do something that is, that is, may still be to some extent parametric, but, is, but allows me a little bit more flexibility than a normal distribution. And so, so what they, they do here is basically to say that the, the average outcome or the uh, the equivalent of the mar the regression equivalent of the marginal treatment effect is a function of 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 x the observed determinants as well as the unobserved determinants that are here but approximated okay so so i approximate the unobserved determinants with this interaction of the, the propensity um, and the uh, and 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 the the x variables, as well as a nonlinear function of the propensity score. And why this is useful, we we will we we shall we shall see, because basically, what uh, apologies if if this this may have. Uh, this may have been a little bit confusing here, but basically the, the, the link between those two is that um, the, the first derivative of, let's call this equation two, with respect to the propensity score should get me to the equivalent of the marginal, uh, of the marginal treatment effect. Yeah. And so, uh, so, so that's what we achieve here. If we take the first derivative of of equation two with respect to the propensity score, that first term here, this one here cancels out, the, the P here is also gone through the derivative and then we're left with the derivative of that nonlinear function with respect to the propensity score. And that nonlinear function accounts for this unobserved component here. This is what we see here. Huh? Um, the question is just, 
What is that K? In the Bjerglund Moffitt model, the K is just a function of the inverse Mills ratio. In a non parametric or semi parametric model, it's something else. It could be a polynomial of the, the propensity score, or it could be um, a, a pairwise comparison of all those bins, and, and it, it could come from, from that. So, what Quantilisten uh, et al. In, in their JPE paper do, for example, is they, they use an outcome equation equivalent to this one here, right? So, so they, they, they obviously do this in a regression framework where they have here a, uh, the, the, the propensity score, so which they first estimate based on, on probit or, or logit, so the propensity score of taking the treatment as a function of whatever the instrument is and, and all the x variables. And then they take that, that um, estimating equation, plug in those, those propensity scores, and simply they approximate Kp, in their case, with a second order polynomial. You could obviously also take a, a, a higher order polynomial. Yeah? And then they estimate the effect of the treatment, which I believe is this, so they're after the effect tau. Hmm. And, and so, so they, they can then calculate the derivative of, uh, of, 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 those, of that function, when they estimate all the parameters, they can calculate the derivative of that function with respect to the propensity score at, at given values of x. And that gives them ultimately the marginal treatment effect curve. So again, to, to uh, come back to, to, to this equation here that admittedly looks quite messy now, let me just repeat this. So ultimately what you want is you want for any propensity score that is then equivalent to UD when people are indifferent, you want to know what the average outcome is. And for, for a given X variable, um, and then the slope of that marginal treatment effects curve is the first derivative of that expectation with with respect to the propensity score. Okay. So what we see here, the marginal treatment effect, that is that is the slope of the, the MTE curve. That is the slope of the curve over here. So if you want to get that slope, we obviously need to have a function that then yields that slope. And that's what we have. That's what we have exactly, exactly here. Um, so, so in essence, we would we would integrate over the the, the marginal treatment effect curve. Um, so, so this uh, this this function here relates the average outcome to the propensity score in a nonlinear fashion. If it was linear, well, then, you know, that that would be the equivalent of that curve being linear. But it could obviously also be, be nonlinear, whereby um, if, if you're here at, let's say, let me draw in here a, a nonlinear curve. If you, you're here at a very low level, let's say you start out at point A and you, you have an instrument that shifts people to point B, it may not increase the average outcome because you know either it doesn't shift many people into treatment or those who shifts into treatment simply doesn't have a huge effect right so so here we have a nonlinear 
relationship or we allow for a nonlinear relationship between the average outcome and the propensity score. And the, the first derivative of, the, of, of that equation with respect to, to uh, the propensity score is the slope of the marginal treatment effects curve, which is what we ultimately want to estimate. When we go back then, um, so we can from that, we, when we estimate that equation, we can back out the, 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 the marginal treatment effect curve for many, many points. Or if we, if we parameterize the, the, the model in, in the way that, that it has been done here and, uh, and estimate, um, estimate those, this parameter and then estimate that parameter, we can actually parameterize and, and, and actually draw the marginal treatment effects curve because based on these parameters, we know exactly what the slope at different propensity scores and at different values of x actually is. Now, this, th there are inbuilt routines that do that in, in various statistical softwares. It's not something that's, that's the super straightforward, um, but for students who learn these methods today, it's definitely something that you will in the future have to wrap your head around. And I admit it's not the, the, the simplest thing to understand. But the most important thing to understand about marginal treatment effects is essentially the, 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 the marginal treatment effect curve that, I, that I've shown you here and why it's useful and it's useful because again if this is the treatment effect and this is the propensity to to uh, to get treated or it's it's actually one minus the propensity of, of getting treated um it then if we do a policy analysis and again we observe we have a natural experiment that shows us that we have a pretty high treatment effect because it shifts those people from a, between A and B, it shifts those people into treatment. We cannot readily extrapolate from those people to others. Why? Well, because the treatment effects for another group, suppose we rather go from B to C, their treatment effect is a lot lower. But if we have the marginal treatment effects curve, and if we are confident about the curve, that this is the correct one, it actually allows us to extrapolate from whatever effects that we, we see with, with our natural experiment to other, uh, to other values and to, to other parts of the population that we currently that are currently under the current conditions, either always takers or never takers. In the lecture slides, I give further references to papers that, that do this very well, who, that either apply this method very well and, and produce a very insightful policy analysis, and also to methods papers that explain in greater detail how that extrapolation from the local average treatment effect by an instrument with, let's say, multiple values or a continuous instrument, how that extrapolation exactly works. And uh, if you do any ana policy analysis in the future, um, you will probably need to, to develop a deep understanding for things like compliance, for heterogeneity in, in treatment effects, because this is more and more recognized as an important challenge, but also a source for very important insights.